Royal Air Force Cinema Corporation presents your own Astra Gazette. Fort Talalak, deep in the Malayan jungle. Just one of the many isolated outposts in the complex anti-terrorist network. And like most of these outposts, it simply couldn't exist without the aircraft and men of the Far East Air Force. In particular, the three squadrons of Far East Transport Wing. The wing's valettas keep them supplied by parachute, and pioneer light aircraft of number 267 squadron, which can land on next to nothing, have the job of changing the guard. Everything the security forces need comes from the sky, and everything doesn't only mean food, ammunition, and medical supplies. It includes such improbable items as cats, film projectors, hayseed, iron lungs, cookeries, lawnmowers, office equipment, sarongs, tractors, typewriters, x-ray equipment, and tennis balls. And as for the personnel landings by Prestwick pioneers, they run through the alphabet from aborigines to zoologists. But it's the Valletta's parachute deliveries which make up the day-to-day -day shopping list. Offensive air operations against the communist terrorists ceased temporarily when the Malayan federal government announced an amnesty in September 1955. But there has been no slackening in the general operational effort of the Far East Air Force. In fact, immediately after the amnesty, transport work, troop lifting and psychological warfare by leaflet dropping and voice aircraft increased considerably. The security forces must be permanently on their toes to protect the Malayan people against any new outbreak of terrorism. Since the emergency began in 1948, the Royal Air Force have done every job aircraft can do, and quite a few that used to be thought impossible. And as long as the need remains, the work goes on. As long ago as 1753, Benjamin Franklin wrote, philosophy as well as foppery often changes fashion. He may well have envisaged the day when men would revolt against the somber British bowler and add color to their headwear. Something to blend with the sports jacket? No, no, not quite what we're looking for. But at this Piccadilly Hatters, which specializes in the new color vogue, there's something for every palette. The businessman, complete with bowler, wants something brighter to blend with his embroidered waistcoat. But he feels the new bowler, known as the stiff, is too big a break from tradition. Colour in men's clothing is nothing new. In fact, the royal courts of the past set a gallant example. But the early 20th century made soberness its preference. They say a leopard can't change his spots, but man is not naturally dull, so let's welcome the change. A visit to Chessington Zoo for a day in the life of a lovely girl with a very unusual job. 19-year-old model Anne Aubrey. She's the girl the newspapers and magazines call on when they want up-to-date photographs of Beauty and the Beast. First up, the vulture's cage. The most forbidding-looking birds and animals fail to scare Anne. For although this is just another job for her, she genuinely loves animals. In fact, she very nearly became a veterinary surgeon. Just to show the birds aren't stuffed ones, this is what happens the moment Anne's restraining influence has gone. Posing with Sheena, the Arabian camel, is not so hazardous, but it's enough to give a lovely girl like Anne the hump, or rather, let's say, it enables her to recapture the mystic atmosphere of the East. By 
now the photographer's happy, Anne's happy, and the camel is very happy. So let's go and cheer up the penguins. Anne's been modeling at different zoos for 18 months. And if she has any favorites, she tries not to show it. Although this group looked jealous enough. At this stage, most girls would discreetly walk out of the picture and seek more amiable animal companions. But not so Anne, who takes these big cats in her stride. On occasions like these, it's a case of watch the birdie, but keep one eye on your companion. Although Anne only has to use her charm, and savage beasts like Simba here are virtually putty in her hands. Of course, some lions are old-fashioned. As kings of the jungle, they don't like posing with pretty girls. So Anne plays a game instead with Barbara the elephant. For whatever happens, it's almost impossible to dampen the spirits of this girl to whom ordinary modeling is a washout. The strangest sight for many a month. Men of the Royal Air Force marching through London's West End for special duty at the premiere of High Flight. In the foyer, high-ranking officers and leading lights in the film world gather and are welcomed by the film's executive producer. Seen here with Air Chief Marshal Sir Dermot Boyle, GCB, KCPO. The United States Air Force has a representative to pay tribute to fellow aviators on this side of the Atlantic. Actor Morris Kaufman introduces one model to another, each in their own right worthy of admiration. Ken Hughes, writer and director of many films, is one of the well-known but often unrecognized backroom boys of the cinema. From the world of aviation this time, Neville Duke, the famous test pilot. The story of the film, incidentally, an aviation drama which carries the Battle of Britain tradition into the supersonic age, is set at Cranwell, the very heart of the Royal Air Force. It's all right, she's not having trouble with her parachute. It's meant to look like that. More soberly clad in this group is the Lord Mayor of London, Alderman Sir Cullum Welch. Among the hundreds of people attending are many whose undying gratitude to the Royal Air Force for their immortal victory in the Battle of Britain is strengthened by this glimpse of the Air Force of today. In flying kit, headed by the captain of the aircraft, comes the crew of a four-jet Vulcan bomber. They are accompanied, as they would be on operations, by fighter pilots of 43 Squadron who did much of the flying in the film. Although flying kit itself may have changed, these men are worthy followers in the same tradition. <laughs> 